Charles Darwin was not trained in the sciences. He was not a scientist. He was not trained in human anatomy. And he even admitted, not only in his publications, but even to colleagues that he wrote to, that his lack of knowledge was a loss in his own understanding of what he was observing. Well, today we're going to be diving into the Galapagos Islands, often claimed to be the birthplace of evolution. So today we're going to take a look at some important highlights of this. We're going to look at, well, what is the history of the Galapagos Islands? We're going to see about the year that it was actually discovered, what they found there. We're also going to look at, well, what is natural selection? Because we often hear natural selection and the term evolution used synonymously together. So it's important for us to break down, well, what are the roots of natural selection? And how do we look at this through God's perfect word? Because is natural selection evolution? And does natural selection contradict biblical creation. We're going to wrap up with that today. So it's important we talk about this because we're actually going to be taking a group of people down to the Galapagos Islands for the very first time. This is the first trip like this by Answers in Genesis. Uh, it is going to be next summer, May 28th through June 7th. So if you want to Join us down there as we actually get hands-on in the environment where Darwin visited as well, but looking at it through the lens of God's perfect word, I encourage you to sign up and join us down there. I will be hosting this event and speaking down there as well, uh, and I am very excited about this. So this is definitely for the adventurous at heart, uh, but you can get more information online. Now, the Galapagos Islands is what is called a volcanic archipelago. So what is an archipelago? Well, it's basically a chain of islands, and they were created by all volcanic activity. Now, what happens is, as volcanic rock solidifies, right, it doesn't take very long for life to take root. And we can see that all throughout the Galapagos Islands. Now, the highest point in the Galapagos Islands is Wolf Volcano that you see here on Isabella Island. It's about 5,600 feet. So the Galapagos Islands, this archipelago, is off the coast of Ecuador in South America in the Pacific Ocean. And it is actually made up of 127 islands, islets, little tiny islands, and rocks. And when we look at this, we see there's actually 13 what we call major islands. And if we measure the entire length of the Galapagos Islands, it's about 267 miles, which is about the size of Yellowstone National Park if you visited there. It kind of gives you an idea. Now, the Galapagos Islands actually runs through the equator, which is pretty neat. So Quito, Ecuador, which is not, you know, right off the coast there of Galapagos Islands, the equator runs through Quito and then actually runs through the Galapagos Islands. One of the things we hope to do when we're in the Galapagos Islands is actually stand on the equator line and you can put your foot in both the northern and southern hemisphere, right? That's like on my bucket list because I think that'll be pretty amazing. Now, an important, important uh, location I'd like to point out here is Baltra. You can see here it's on the island of Santa Cruz. This is important because this was actually a U.S. military base in World War II that was established after the Pearl Harbor attacks. So very important to the U.S., especially during that period of history located right there in the Galapagos Islands. And thank you to all those who serve um, in our military or have served. We appreciate you so much for your sacrifice. Now, if we look at the Galapagos Islands, we can actually see the very first recorded visit to there. Now, could people have been there before that? Yes, right? But this is the first recorded document that we do have. In 1535, we have records by a Dominican friar whose name was Berlanga. He was the Bishop of Panama. And what happened is, is he was traveling from Panama to Peru. And while he was traveling there, currents accidentally swept him to the Galapagos Islands. So he was the first one to actually record these giant tortoises that he saw there, and cacti and other living organisms. Now, not long after that, we're looking a little over 100 years, we had an important visit by two Englishmen named William Dampier and William Crawley. And they were the first, you could say, explorers to record what they saw at the Galapagos Islands in English. And while they were there, they actually coined the word sea lion, right, because they saw these marine creatures, right, that hadn't really been recorded before, and they actually created that word for them. And 1,000 other English words were added to the language at that time based on their discoveries that they did see there. Now, in the 1600s and early 1700s in the Galapagos Islands, we had a lot of 
pirate activity as well going on there. And they, when uh, the Dampier was there and Crawley, they also were writing things down from that naturalist perspective. Now, in 1720, we had the very last pirate that's known to visit the island. Now, I will say, though, uh, my daughter lived there for about five months last year, and she said while she was there, that pirate ship pulled up in the bay, and all these people got off kind of dressed like pirates, but I think it was more of a tourist attraction, right? So there's not really still pirates uh, going to the Galapagos Islands. What's interesting about John Cliverton is that, now this is, there's some uh, debate over whether this is truth or not, but they claim that when Clipperton visited the islands, he found a man who had been marooned there and had been there for some time. And his records and his account uh, based on this gentleman inspired the writing of Robinson Crusoe. But there's not 100% verification of that. But there's a lot of story to that, so it could possibly be true. Then in the late 1700s to early 1800s, uh, like I said, we have this whaling activity going on as well. Then in 1793, we have something kind of important there, and that's when James Cornett establishes a post office box on Florina, the island of Florina, which was long used by whalers, but today it is actually still a functioning, as you could say, post office box. So this is one of the major tourist attractions there. So what tourists do is they go and they leave postcards in the mailbox here, and it's been functioning since 1793, so this is quite some time. Now, when you visit there, you're supposed to go to the mailbox, and you're supposed to go through the postcards that need to be mailed, and you're supposed to look for postcards that are going to your country, and then you're supposed to take them with you and mail them to the address, put a stamp on it, and mail it when you get, to, when you get back home, uh, and then you're supposed to leave some there from you, right, to people all over the world. Uh, so they say people still do visit this and still exchange mail right here um, at this post office box, so that's pretty cool. Now, in 1832, Ecuador does take possession of the Galapagos Islands. It is now recognized as a national park of Ecuador. Now, something important happens, and that is in 1831, and this is when Charles Darwin leaves on his worldwide adventure um, on the uh, HMS Beagle, and he is gone for, from 1831 to 1836, about five years. And during that time period, he does stop at the Galapagos Islands for a five-week period. So in September 17, 1835, lands in the Galapagos Islands, and he visits San Cristobal from September 17th through the 22nd. He visits Florina from September 24th to the 27th. He goes to Isabella from September 29th to October 2nd, and then Santiago October 8th through the 17th. And while he's there, he's collecting geological and biological samples from the different islands. Now, when he was there, and this is really important to realize, he had not yet developed his evolutionary ideas, right? He's still just kind of studying nature. He's collecting different samples. Many of the specimens he did not catalog. So he did not keep, like we would say, detailed records on a lot of the specimens that he did gather while he was there. And later on, after he left the islands, he actually had to go rely on seamen that he was traveling with to get information on these specimens because a lot of the seamen were very interested as well, and they did keep these detailed records. Now, what's really interesting is that evolutionists give such reverence, right, to the Galapagos Islands, but Charles Darwin only devotes about 1% of what is eventually published in The Origin of Species to his time on the Galapagos Islands. So we need to take a look at, well, then where did he get a lot of his influence, right? Because it wasn't necessarily directly at the Galapagos Islands. So we need to look at the history of natural selection. And it actually goes back quite some time. This was not a term that Charles Darwin kind of came up with by himself, right? We see it goes back to the third and fourth century where those origins are back, you know, actually back to Greek philosophy. And then we have a, what we call pretty significant development that directly influenced Darwin as well, and that was a publication by William Paley in 1802 that was called Natural Theology. Now, Natural Theology argued that the attributes of God must be sufficient, right, for his creation, and William Paley really focused on the beauty and the design of human anatomy. He was a Christian, and he recognize that we see just this intricate, um, we would say complexity in the human body as glory to the creator God. 
Now, natural theology was actually so important that it became what's called canon at Cambridge University for up to 50 years, like after William Paley died. So we know that Charles Darwin would have read this particular important work because Charles Darwin was a student at Cambridge between 1827 and 1831. Now, another important publication occurs from Edward Blythe between 1835 and 1837. Now this is the exact time that Charles Darwin is now on the HMS Beagle, right? So during that time, Edward Blythe publishes these articles on natural selection. He publishes several. Now he was an English zoologist. He studied birds, he was a scientist. He was, uh, even studied the breeding of domestic animals and different genetic traits that would come out. But unlike what we see in Charles Darwin when he eventually publishes his ideas, Blythe saw natural selection as a preserving factor of creative things, not a unlimited liberalizing one that we're gonna see Charles Darwin supports. Now, Charles Darwin returned from his voyages, right, in 1836, and when he returns, he starts kind of like meditating and think about everything he saw, he's reading, Edward Blythe's publications, right? We know he's influenced by these other gentlemen that we just talked about, and we can clearly see those influences in the publication of Origin of Species. But Origin of Species does not come out till 1859, so just keep that in mind. That's over 20 years after he returns from the Galapagos Islands. So what we see is that Charles Darwin starts to write down, all right, his thoughts right, in his journals, and we actually have documents, right, that we can go back and refer to, our primary sources, as we would call it. And what we see in The Origin of Species, as published in 1859, is almost verbatim a lot of what Edward Blythe had published, to the point that if it was today, it would probably be considered plagiarism. That's how close the wording is that we see taken from Edward Blythe's uh, information about natural selection. So here we see in the 1830s, this is dated at 1837, this is one of Charles Darwin's notebook, it's referred to as Notebook B, and in there we see this sketch or this very simplistic drawing. It is one of the first drawings you could say that kind of refers to the evolutionary tree of life, where we have this little starting point where you see this little number one, and then we start to see these branches and divisions. What is so important here is what else do you see on this page? What did Charles Darwin write at the very top? He said, I think. It was just a thought, it was an idea. You know, Charles Darwin was not trained in the sciences. He was not a scientist. He was not trained in human anatomy. And he even admitted, not only in his publications, but even to colleagues that he wrote to, that his lack of knowledge was a loss in his own understanding of what he was observing. So that's just so important to realize. So he's 51 years old now, and he publishes um, on the origin of species, almost considered to be the Bible of evolution, right? Many people look at it like that. And there are four main hypotheses that you could say are present throughout this publication. And we're gonna talk briefly about each of these, but most importantly, focus on natural selection. So the first one was variation among species. He recognized, Charles Darwin, that based on ideas, remember in his mind, he thinks there's no limit to variation in the living things that we see on the earth. But we actually do observe very clear limitations, don't we? We see limitations within created kinds. Uh, we don't see dogs all of a sudden sprouting wings, do we, right? We see that you can have different dog breeds, but there are clear limits to that. But Charles Darwin honestly believed there was no limit to variation, and you have to believe that if you're going to believe in evolutionary ideas. You have to believe that things can gain information and turn into something else, basically. Now, Charles Darwin knew nothing about genetics. Right? If he, they have said so many times that if he even had an ounce of the understanding of genetics that we do today, all of his ideas and his publications would have been considered invalid, right? Because we know now with genetics uh, that many of what he proposed is not, you know, is not even possible. So let's take a look at variation among species. Here is something that he did see. Uh, he did observe birds. Now he really liked mockingbirds. That was actually the bird that he studied 
the most, even though the finches are most often associated with him. That was actually not the case. It was mockingbirds, and he noticed there are four different species of mockingbird across the islands. But he still recognized them all as mockingbirds, right? He said, they're mockingbirds, they just look a little bit different. Then there were those Galapagos finches, right? And the Galapagos finches, he noticed, had different beak sizes based on the environment that they lived in, right? They had different shapes, different sizes. But he still recognized them all as finches, right? They were all still that same type of bird, but yes, they had this variation. Now, the second thing that he really focuses on and on the origin of species is the inheritance of favorable characteristics, right? Well, what does that mean? Well, this largely came from Lamarckian. And basically what this says is organisms acquire characteristics over their lifetime, and then they're able to pass it on to the next generation. Imagine an organism actually being able to gain new information and then pass that on to their offspring. Well, now with the study of genetics, this theory has been completely discredited uh, because we know that is not how organisms reproduce and pass on genetic information. Now, the third one is the struggle for existence, and this was largely influenced by someone named Thomas Malthus. And what he was basically saying is, well, there's an overproduction in animals, and so there's going to be this struggle going on, this kill or be killed idea. Uh, and because there's this overproduction, there's going to be supply shortages related to that, and it's this eaten or be eaten, eaten you know, environment that we live in. Then the last one was this natural selection, or synonymous with that is survival of the fittest. And basically what this means is either you leave offspring or you don't. Now, a lot of people think that like survival of the fittest is the lion's able to kill the zebra and eat the zebra, therefore the lion is more fit and the lion survives. But that's not actually what survival of the fittest means. Survival of the fittest actually occurs within a particular species or kind, as you could say. So let's say we have a lion who kills a zebra and is able to eat the zebra. Then they may say that lion is more fit than a lion who tries to kill a zebra and is unsuccessful and then doesn't get food and ends up, let's say, passing away or dying because of that. Well, the lion who was successful must be more fit, and therefore that lion's going to live on, while the weak ones don't. So it's an important distinction that we have to make between um, when we talk about natural selection is it's recurring inside these what we call species of animals. Now, some of these things that Charles Darwin observed, one was the Galapagos tortoises, right? So he noticed there was two different shapes in the carapace or the tortoise shell. And when we take a look at the first one, the saddleback tortoise, it actually has what's called a, like a rise in the front of that carapace. And this actually allows the tortoise to lift its head and eat cactus. That's what it feeds on primarily. So having this indentation on the top allows it to raise its head and eat what it, you know, what it consumes for its substances, which is different from our dome-shaped tortoise. The dome-shaped tortoise does not have this elevation in the carapace. Well, the dome-shaped tortoise eats vegetation that's close to the ground. It doesn't need to lift its head up to eat off the cactus plants. So we see a distinct difference, right, in the type of shell these tortoise have, but they're still all tortoise. In fact, there's only one created kind of tortoise, and all tortoises fall under that kind, and they are at a distinctly different kind than our turtles. Right? So we see a distinct difference there. But if we take a look here, right, we can see on this particular, the giant tortoise of the Galapagos, you can see it has that raised indent on the top above its head, allowing it to lift its head and eat vegetation at higher levels than in the dome-shaped tortoise. Clear design and genetic variability that God put in them, right, to live in the environments uh, that he created for them, but they're still just tortoise. That's what's important to realize. So what is natural selection? So we kind of, we've been using that term, but let's break that down. And we're going to look at this through the lens of God's perfect word and man's imperfect word, right? There's only two worldviews out there. It's either God or man. And when we look at the term natural selection and look at this through these two lenses, uh, we're going to see that 
there is a direct Darwinian influence right, in the secular worldview of natural selection, influenced by the gentlemen, right, who published these, uh, and, you know, we would say peer-reviewed literature that Darwin read, as well as his vid visit to the Galapagos, and it influences the very de definition of natural selection that we see today. So let's actually look at, well, how do they define natural selection today? So this is National Geographic Education 2023, they say natural selection is one of the processes that drives evolution and helps to explain the diversity of life on Earth. Britannica actually says natural selection, variations in the genotype that increase an organism's chances of survival. They say evolution often occurs as a consequence of this process, right? They're always using them together. If we take a look at Berkeley University, they say natural selection is one of the basic mechanisms of evolution. The Natural History Museum says natural selection is a mechanism of evolution. And we can see in The Origin of Species, right, this is what they claim. Charles Darwin offered a compelling answer to the outstanding question of biology, which was how life on Earth had evolved. Charles Darwin himself, in chapters six and nine, said all species of life have evolved through a process called natural selection. So when we go to the Galapagos Islands, that's one of the things we're gonna be doing, is we're actually gonna be visiting more islands than Charles Darwin did during his visits while he was there, and we're gonna be looking at these living things. Uh, because, you know, Charles Darwin said that there was a highly logical alternative to explain the distribution and types of species, and he termed this natural selection. This is kind of where that term came from. And here's what's so important about this. All of these observations, and they're claiming the observations that he made on the Galapagos Islands, ran contrary to the reasoning behind special creation. Special creation was the dominant belief at that time, right? We're talking about the, late, the early 1800s, even the late 1800s, after the publication of Origin of Species, they believed that there was a biblical creator God as described in the Bible. Most scientists studied science to give glory to the creator, to study his creation. But they were looking for something that would explain origins outside of a creator, right? People always want to reject the idea there's a biblical creator, someone they will be accountable to one day, right? We don't need to worry about that now, right? That's what they're saying. We have an explanation for what we see without a creator God. So here's some of Darwin's basic observations. He said, well, species on the islands were endemic to the islands. What that means is, we see, yes, variation in species, but they're only living on specific islands. Well, not surprising. They're islands, they're separated by water. Transportation between the islands would not have been very accessible right during the early 1800s, so not surprising to see that. He said the animals on the islands resembled mainland animals. He recognized them as mockingbirds. He recognized them as finches. He recognized them as tortoise, right, because they looked like animals that lived on the mainland. He also found fossils that resembled, resembled modern animals. Well, that's what we'd expect to see, right? What we see in the fossil record, some of those animals are extinct, but a lot of the fossils look a lot like the animals that we have today. And he also discovered seashells in high mountains. Well, not surprising, right? We have a global flood account that's given to us in Genesis, and we do find seashells all over the earth, on mountaintops, and everywhere in between. So now let's take a look at this through a biblical worldview. What does the Bible say about the origin of species? Well, we can go to the very first verse of the Bible. Genesis 1.1 says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the Bible, which is our perfect history book, tells us exactly what God created about 6,000 years ago in six literal 24-hour days. And during this creation account in Genesis chapter 1, there's a very important phrase that is used repeatedly. We can see this in Genesis 1, 11 through 12, where God says, let the earth sprout vegetation according to its kind. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed according to their own kinds, trees bearing fruit according to its kind. We can see in Genesis 1, 20 through 21, let the birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the heavens according to their kind 
kinds and every winged bird according to its kind. And it goes on to describe the creation of land animals according to their kind. In fact, in Genesis chapter 1, we see this phrase used 10 times. And even in the account of the global flood, when God describes the animals that are going to be sent to the ark, he uses the term according to its kind. Well, that leads us to ask the question, right? This is very important to understand is, well, what is a kind? So we have to go back to Linnaean taxonomy. So I know many of you, if you go way back to elementary school, you're going to remember this. You probably remember learning biological classification, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Well, when we break this down, you're going to, and it's important to realize too, when we talk about taxonomy, this is a man-made system. And biological taxonomy is always changing. I say especially since uh, as they map out the genomes of living things and our understanding of the DNA code is, is becoming more clear, especially all throughout creation, things are starting, are always getting moved around on this classification system. But there is a very clear, I like to say, like barrier in place here that we can see where organisms have the ability to reproduce, and that is about at that family level. So let's take a look at an example. Let's imagine that we have all these creatures you see here. They are all considered animals, so they are under kingdom animalia. But now we need to go to phylum, right? Kingdom phylum, that's our next focus. We're focusing down to one organism. So if we go to phylum chordata, chordata means that these are organisms that have a backbone. You'll notice that our starfish has dropped off, right? A starfish is an invertebrate. They do not have backbones, so they can't be in this classification. So we're getting more focused. Now let's move to class mammalia. Well, mammals are warm-blooded, aren't they? So our lizard that was cold-blooded is no longer here, right? It's no longer in this category. It's classified in a different class. So now let's go to order carnivora. Well, these are creatures that are going to be meat-eaters, right? They are carnivores. Well, squirrels are not carnivores, so our little squirrel now is in a different order. Now let's go to that family level. What do you notice at this family level? If you take a look at all three of these, you would call them all bears, right? We look at those, we recognize the similarity here. We say, yeah, these are all bears. And they all have the ability to reproduce at this level. Now, if we wanted to classify the brown bear, let's say we want to get more specific, he actually falls under genus Ursus, and then his species is Ursus arctos. So that takes us down to one specific animal, but you can see how we start with kingdom, right? All animals in this very broad category, we use a classification system to get down to genus species. But it is at this family level where we have this similarity, where we have the ability to reproduce, where chromosomes can align and exchange genetic information and create offspring. And if we take a look at that word kind, the original Hebrew is min, right? We see this at that kind level is where animals have that ability. Now, if we take a look and actually observe what we see in the world today, that is what we see, right? We can directly observe what we call an orchard of life, not the evolutionary tree of life. What we see is that there is an orchard where different organisms will reproduce according to their kind or within their family. Do we see variety within those kinds? Absolutely, and we'll talk a little bit more about that, but this is something that's directly observable. And you know, for thousands of years, the majority of scientists supported this worldview. They said the Earth is young, about 6,000 years, and it was created by the God of the universe. So natural selection is selecting information that already exists in a population. And that's what's key. The genetic diversity that we observe, right, was placed by God into creatures at creation. And we do see genetic change since creation. So do we believe in natural selection? Absolutely, it's observable. We can see that. It's an observable process. Why? Where organisms are gonna get specific characteristics, but to help them reproduce in certain environments. What is really important here, though, is that natural selection is a loss of information, a loss of genetic information. 
For evolution to be true, it requires a gain of information. An organism has to gain new information to evolve into a brand new creature. That's what's, we've never observed that. But what we do observe is a clear loss of information. So if we take a look at dogs, for example, we can clearly see that there is a loss of information from the wolf to the fluffy poodle, right? I think we could all clearly see that. And this is a problem for evolutionists, right? Evolutionists, if you believe in molecules to man, right? If you believe that, this, this, that the complexity we see today is just some random chance processes, you have to have directional change. Uh, but that is just not observable. So no new information is added in natural selection, but information is lost. And this is completely opposite of what is required for evolution. For evolution to be true, we have to have a gain of information. This one cell that came to life, we can't explain how millions of years ago, just trust us it did, and then it evolved into all the living things we see today. Well, it had to gain information, right? It had to gain information to get fins, it had to gain information to get legs, it had to gain information to get hair and fur and all the different features, wings and feathers. It has to gain information. That has never once been observed. So do we have observational science for natural selection? Yeah, we can observe that. Do animals change? Yes, they do, right? We can directly observe it. But are they changing outside of their created kinds? Well, no. So we can take dogs and we can select for certain traits, can't we? So we have over 500 different dog breeds today, all different types of dogs. But can they select for traits for a dog to all of a sudden sprout wings and fly away? No, it's not in the genetic code. It's an impossibility. So even though we have variation, we're limited to the created kinds. I always like to say in the DNA code, just imagine there's like these invisible walls there, right? Where things, it's impossible for things to reproduce outside their created kind. The DNA code of life that God spoke into existence during creation week only allows for things to reproduce. That information has to talk and has to be able to exchange. Now let's take a look at what this may have looked like, the genetic diversity that would have occurred after the global flood, right? Because we have, as you can see here, there's this reset. We have creation, we have living things reproducing, we have variation within kinds, but then there's a line, isn't there? We have a global reset. Man became exceedingly wicked all the time. The Bible tells us that. And a righteous God had to come and pass judgment. He tells Noah to build an ark of salvation. And the Bible tells us that God sent two of each animal, seven of some, to the ark of salvation. So how many dogs are on the ark? Well, the Bible clearly tells us two of each kind right? Not two of each dog breed, not two of each species. Of course, these words were all developed after the Bible was written, but I'm just giving you context here. The Bible says two of each kind. So imagine two at that family level. So we have two dogs on the ark. They're on the ark about a year, right? The ark lands, and then God gives them permission to leave the ark. And as the animals left the ark, they would have started to reproduce according to their kinds. So imagine we have these two dogs, they get off the ark and they start to reproduce, creating lots and lots of dogs fairly quickly. And those dogs carry genetic information, don't they? And that genetic information and those genetic traits are going to spread with the dog population across the face of the earth. So let's look at an example here. And we're gonna take a look at these two original dog kind, because we do believe that the original dog kind and the two on the ark would have had the genetic potential to create all the different dog breeds we see today. So let's assume these dogs have what's an SL we call gamete information. So that means they have an S for short hair and they're carrying the L for long hair. Each of them are going to carry this information. Now what you're looking at here is information from the mother so let's imagine the mother contributes the short-haired information and the father contributes the long-haired information. And these two dogs that get off the ark carry the ability to pass on short hair or long hair. Now let's say they have offspring and because of their genetic potential, they could produce a dog that has just short hair. Each of the S, the one S from each of them comes together, we have a short haired dog. We could also have a medium haired dog. And then we could also have a dog that's capital L, capital L, long hair only, okay? Everybody following so far? 
All right. Now let's imagine this offspring goes to a very cold climate. And because it's so cold, our dogs that have that short hair gene, what's going to happen? They're going to get really cold and they're going to die. Very sad, right? What's left? Well, our dog with only the two long-haired information. Have we gained or lost information here? We have lost information. We've lost the short-haired gene. So what is the only offspring these two long-haired dogs can have? More dogs with long hair, and they're going to survive in that cold climate. Now let's imagine we have that offspring, and they move to a very hot climate. And if you have really long, fluffy hair in that hot climate, what's going to happen? you are not going to survive. And those traits for short hair are going to be selected out. Well, what is a dog that only has short-haired gamete information? It is only going to be able to reproduce short-haired dogs. Is this a gain or a loss of information? The loss of information. So what we see is those, those two dogs got off the ark, they had all this genetic potential, but certain traits would have been selected for based on the environments that they lived in. And this is information and design that the creator God of the universe put there at creation. And we don't only observe this in dogs, we see it in cats as well. We can clearly see a loss of genetic information from, we say, the lion to the domestic house cat. We clearly have a loss of information, but yet they're still all cats. Horse kind as well, right? Animals can reproduce according to their kind. And so we have a Zorse and Zonkey down at the Ark Encounter. Make sure you go say hi to them while you're down there. Uh, but we like to have those as examples that, yes, right? Animals can reproduce, right? Zebras can reproduce with horses and create a Zorse. Uh, and we see this all throughout God's creation. We even see this in the fossil record where, yes, we would recognize all of these as um, we would call triceratops, or the ceratopsian kind, uh, but they're still a little bit different, right? We see this variation within created kinds. So how many triceratops were on the ark? Or I should say ceratopsian kind were on the ark. We would say two, right? God had two go to the ark. They would have had all the genetic potential to create the ceratopsians after the global flood. So natural selection, right? does not provide any brand new information. It is pulling information that already exists, completely opposite of evolution, which requires new information. So when we take a look at this, right, we always have to ask the question and think about the two types of science. And we have observational science, which is where we can use the scientific method. We can directly observe, we can record, we can document, we can smell, we can taste, we can feel, we can use our five senses, and we can replicate that experiment versus things that are unobservable in their original form. So do we uh, directly observe? Can we observe variation within kind? Yes, right, we see that today. We see things only reproducing within their kinds, and we do see variation limited to those kinds. This is directly observable, but this is opposite of what we call historical science or things that are unobservable in their original form. And the perfect example of that is the evolutionary tree of life. There is absolutely no observational science to support this idea at all. It is nothing more than an idea, all right? It is become a religion in and of itself now as well, but there is no observational science to support this as, at all. So even when we look at Darwinian origins as we have, we can see that is nothing more than historical science. And remember, what did Charles Darwin write himself? I think. So if you join us in the Galapagos Islands, we're going to be looking at some of those creatures that he observed. And yes, we're going to be able to see variation within kind, but they're still reproducing within those boundaries that God created. One of the things we'll be looking at as the geologic effects of volcanic activity, except the last eruption in Galapagos Islands was in 2015. So some of those volcanoes on the islands are still considered active. One of the organisms we'll be looking at is the salty lightfoot crab. Do we see variation between, in just these two photographs, these two organisms? Yeah, we see a little bit of variation, don't we? But will we still look at them and identify them as a crab, right? A salty lightfoot crab, yes. How about the Galapagos penguin? Do we see a little bit of difference there? Do we see what we call variation? Is this evolution? 
No, they're still just penguins. The Galapagos land iguana is another example of that. Do we see variation here? We sure do, right? But they're still just iguana. How about the infamous Galapagos finch? <laughs> All right, so famous because it's so directly related to Charles Darwin. Do we see variation? Yes. Can we see variation limited to the islands? Yes, that's what he observed when he was there. But they're still just finches, right? They're still just birds. It was funny when my daughter was in the Galapagos Islands, she sends me a, a picture one day and she says, hey mom, look, it's Darwin's finch. And she sent me a picture of a finch and she goes, guess what? It still looks like a finch. <laughs> so nothing much has changed, right? We see variation, but they're still only reproducing within their created kinds. I can't wait to see this bird up close and personal, the uh, blue-footed booby. Just beautiful in color, but yes, once again, we can take a look and see. We can see slight variations there, but they're doing nothing more than reproducing within their created kinds. They're pulling from existing information that God already put in place there. Now, Darwin admitted that there were problems right, with his ideas, and he published this. So here's one. We see in, the, uh, in his publication of On the Origin of Species, he said, why, if species have descended from other species by insensibly fine graduations, do we not everywhere see innumerable transitional forms? He expected to find evidence to support the idea in the fossil record. And guess what? It's not there. There are no transitional forms in the fossil record. He went on to say, if numerous species belonging to the same genre or family have, been, have really started into life all at once, right? He's referring to what here? Creation. The fact would be fatal to the theory to descent with slow modification through natural selection. He went on to say, consequently, if my theory be true, it is indisputable that before the lowest Silurian stratum was deposited, and he's referring to fossil layers here, long periods elapsed as long as, or probably far longer than, the whole interval from the Silurian age to the present day, and that during these vast yet quite unknown periods of time, the world swarmed with living creatures. To the question why we do not find records of these vast primordial periods, I can give no satisfactory answer. He goes, the case at present must remain inexplicable and may be truly urged as a valid argument against the views here entertained. And if he was alive today, he would have to recant pretty much everything he published in On the Origin of Species because genetic science has greatly disproved a lot of the things that he published. So is natural selection evolution? Let's answer this question, right? The answer is no. The definition is different. This is the one takeaway I want you to get out of this talk today. Natural selection is a loss of information and evolution is a gain of information. Do we see mutations? Yes, right? But that's nothing more than the effect of sin on God's biblical creation. Mutations are a loss of information. Natural selection only occurs within the created kinds. Does, do we see change in animals? Do we see variation? Yes, but it's limited to that orchard of life that we talked about. So does natural selection contradict biblical creation? No, right? Creationist view of natural selection is supported both biblically and scientifically. We can directly observe this today. Natural selection is a God-ordained process that allows organisms to survive, right? It's observable, and, and we know that it occurs in the present, has occurred in the past. It takes advantages of those variations he put into the genetic code within kinds to preserve that variability in the created animals that we do see today. And this applies to the plant kingdom as well. We see genetic variation there. You know, Colossians 2.8 2, says, See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition and according to the elemental spirits of the world and not according to Christ. There is no question, especially if your kids are in public school or grandkids or if you were in public school as a child, that you were definitely, they tried to take captive of your minds with these evolutionary ideas. And you may have even seen some of the diagrams that we looked at in your science books, right, when you were in school. 
But you are not the result of molecules to man evolution. You are made in the image of God, right? You are created for a divine purpose. You have value and you have worth in the creator God and your relationship with him is the most important decision you can make. And if there's one thing we want you to do while you're here at the Creation Museum today is please make sure that you have reconciled that relationship with the creator of the universe so that you have that hope and peace of knowing you're going to spend eternity with him. What a difference it makes in our lives when we realize that we are truly, right, an image bearer of the creator, giving gifts to glorify him.